I'm just going to talk about um, MS treatments that are available and there are some upcoming treatments. I'm not going to go into any uh, huge details. Uh, there is very good information on various MS society, MS stress sites about the treatments that uh, you know people of all background can understand. So I'm just going to give an overview briefly and uh, sort of uh, discuss the direction of, of research and treatments that uh, we are going in and where there still is um, lack of improvement and um, and hopefully that will generate you know questions and, and discussion. So as we discussed um, uh, in our earlier talks, um, uh, MS is a uh, autoimmune and degenerative chronic disease. So at, it, in the beginning, there is predominantly inflammatory pathology, uh, and as the disease evolves over the years, the inflammation gives way to predominantly degenerative pathology. The um, current treatments are predominantly uh, targeting the immune mechanisms, be it in a relapsing MS or be it in progressive MS. And, and that's why we want to try and diagnose patients early and treat them early where the um, inflammatory pathology is amenable to treatment. Um, the, the tricky bit is the um, MS is quite a heterogeneous condition. So a patient um, may respond to one drug very well, but may not necessarily um, respond to the same extent to another drug, or, or one patient may develop side effects, serious side effects to one drug, another may not. So it, it becomes tricky to decide whether we should be treating everybody with um, sort of uh, all the strongest possible medications, or how should we be um, uh, sort of using treatments uh, uh, in an appropriate uh, discretion or discretionary way to say where, where there will be um, minimum side effects, less of a treatment burden, and uh, at the same time, a very good treatment efficacy. The immune system is very complex, and it, it, it causes inflammation for good reasons. It, it fights the bugs, the viruses, the bacteria. Um, at the same time, uh, it has um, a part of it that looks after healing process, repairing, scavenging. It looks after it sort of uh, not reacting to the food antigen. So tolerance is important. And so when you are trying to suppress immune system, um, it also does cancer surveillance. So when there are rogue cells that are developing into cancer, it just stops them right, right away. So when you are trying to suppress immune system, you, um, it's like a double-edged sword. You, you may be uh, giving up some of these good things that the immune system does. And, and we have to try and um, develop treatments that will um, have targeted um, effect uh, on the inflammation specific to MS, but at the same time not causing any problems by um, suppressing the good bits of the immune system. So the, the target uh, would be inflammation, so uh, uh, suppressing the immune system, um, but also as the de degeneration sets in uh, due to the injury to the, to the nerve, the axon, uh, because of the inflammation, uh, you may want to uh, target um, repair you may want to target uh, remyelination, so there has been demyelination, which then um, renders the nerve axon vulnerable to stress injury and therefore degeneration, and then uh, the loss of axon resulting into uh, permanent uh, disability. So the treatment could be targeted at um, reducing or stopping the inflammation completely, then um, in, uh, promoting remyelination promoting repair, and also, uh, if possible, we would like to regenerate, a, re regenerate those lost neurons and therefore um, get, uh, get back the function that was lost. So this is a cartoon, um, again, similar to the uh, cartoons um, showed in the previous talks. You've got the, the brain tissue, that, uh, the neuron that is uh, nicely isolated and protected uh, within what we call as a blood-brain barrier. So the blood-brain barrier does not allow all the usual inflammations, infections that are carried through. You know, we breathe, we eat a lot of stuff, 
lots of things get access to the blood that doesn't have immediate access to the central nervous system. So in MS, you've got these pathways that are triggered whereby the immune cells are signaled um, to go and they have got, uh, and they're allowed access to the nervous system through uh, breakage of this blood-brain barrier. So the, the immune uh, cells, the T lymphocytes, the B lymphocytes um, that start um, proliferating into the lymphoid tissue and then get into the blood and from in, into the blood, into the brain, and then cause the inflammation and um, demyelination and subsequently degeneration. And various treatments currently available um, are target a number of different pathways uh, in the uh, immune system. So, uh, and I'll go briefly through um, uh, the treatments that are available just now. Uh, and this cartoon shows that basically they stop the, the cells proliferating, be it in the lymphoid tissue or the, uh, the drug stops uh, the cells getting access to the uh, nervous system by blocking the blood-brain barrier um, uh, and some of the um, drugs um, work on the signaling pathways that will uh, down-regulate the immune system. So calm it down rather than constantly on alert. And these does um, help stop or reduce the inflammation. So these are the treatments we uh, currently have available to us. Um, in the 1990s, we started using um, interferon beta. Interferons are um, uh, sort of immune proteins that are normally produced by our immune system. So we've got interferon alpha, interferon beta, and gamma. And these sort of help signal up sort of activity of the immune system fighting against viruses. And the interferon beta have been shown um, for many years now over the um, uh, extended uh, follow-up studies that they reduce the immune um, inflammation, they reduce the disability as a result of that. Um, so, but these have been, um, in, in, in the large population studies, about um, relatively moderately effective in that uh, we use something called as annualized relapse rate in that uh, a clinical relapse that you get um, a number of them in a year. So the, the effectiveness was about 30% in that they reduce about one in three um, relapses. But in some patients, that's all that will be needed in that they'll not have any further relapses, they'll not have any MR activity, but in many patients, that may not be enough and they may need something stronger or a different kind of uh, immunosuppressive therapy. Um, the glatiramer acetate was in a similar timeline, which is a, a sort of a myelin-like molecule, which again helps um, downregulate the immune response to the myelin. Um, important thing is to look at the, um, the disease um, uh, efficacy, disease management efficacy, but at the same time, the treatment burden. These are injectable, so some of them you have to take every other day, some of them you may have to take every day. Um, there are local side effects. Often patients don't like the reminder that they have to take a medication, and they don't like to be reminded they have a condition that they are somehow uh, unwell or, or sick. Um, on the other hand, because these are relatively milder or moderate drugs, the potential risks are that they could cause serious harm is much lower as opposed to some of the newer, very effective treatments. Um, so we've got some uh, oral treatments, and these are obviously been much more favored because you don't have to take any injections. Um, it's much easier to take. Sometimes take. Um, it's difficult to remember to take oral ta um, treatment tablets, and we know that from other trials like Parkinson's disease, and uh, uh, where if you have to take a tablet every day or all the time, there are times that you will forget to take. So that's something we have to look into as well in terms of when um, 
uh, developing a drug that, that it should be hopefully uh, ca causing less side effects, causing less of patient um, treatment burden, that they don't have to take it for long because it is long acting. Um, some of the um, medications when you're on, you, you may not be able to take live vaccines because your immune system is so suppressed that um, even an inactivated live vaccine could cause um, uh, an infection or, or, uh, or a condition. So um, some of the very effective treatments there, there is uh, the Lemtrada Lemtuzumab. These are uh, Tizabri, Ocrevus, we, or Ocrelizumab. So these are what we call as um, biological therapies or, or uh, monoclonal antibodies. They have got a map at the end of them. So th these are antibodies that target um, different types of um, immune cells. So uh, the, the lemtuzumab will target what we call as T cell uh, immunity. The um, ocrelizumab um, targets what we call as B cell immunity. So the, the antibodies uh, producing cells, whereas the natalizumab um, will stop the immune cells um, having access to the uh, nervous system through the blood-brain barrier. There are serious potential risks associated with this very effective treatment. So we worry about progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy with, with Tizabri. Uh, and initially, uh, some of you may remember that the drug was um, licensed and then withdrawn for a, for a while. and then. Um, relicensed with an ongoing monitoring program called Touch program, where all the patients are monitored and all the cases of PML are registered. So we are getting better at monitoring, uh, but some, sometimes that's the only effective treatment for some patient, and and we ha we we constantly worry um, as to um, whether they will get uh, any significant harm from these medications. Um, recently, we have got. Um, Ocrelizumab, which uh, again is quite uh, effective treatment. Again, you need to come in for um, uh, infusions, uh, and there are potential, um, again, risks to be uh, monitored in terms of their long-term immunosuppression. Um, Cladirabin has been recently um, uh, licensed and approved by SMC, so we'll have slightly um, improved uh, um, treatment burden in, in that category in that it's an oral tablet, uh, but it's highly effective, and you won't need a sort of a frequent monitoring similar to what we might expect with something like uh, Lemtrada, where you have to have monthly blood tests for um, at least four years after you have had uh, your last infusion. Uh, and that may be because uh, you know, there are long-term autoimmune uh, side effects that you uh, get with Lemtrada. Um, we have previously used um, mitoxantron, so it's a chemotherapeutic agent used for leukemias. Uh, and when all these other effective treatments were not available, uh, we used to use it. And again, it is very toxic. It can cause uh, cardiomyopathy. And in some uh, patients, it may develop later on um, uh, leukemia in itself because it's suppressing one type of uh, immune system, but at the same time, it, it may allow to proliferate other type of immune system. Um, we have got currently ongoing trials with the um, uh, hemopoietic stem cell therapy, and uh, it's it's still uh, uh, targeting the the immune mechanism of the disease and not necessarily regenerating or remyelinating. What we are aiming to do is shutting down the bone marrow and then resetting it back with your own stem cells, which don't have the same memory that the immune system has developed over the years, which then targets the myelin and the central nervous system. Um, depending on how severely you shut down the bone marrow, the, uh, the risk um, can be high in terms of you can get 1% to 2% mortality, but there are emerging um, better uh, protocols to try and do a softer bone marrow shutdown, and that may help with um, improving the safety um, of, the, of the stem cell treatment. So um, what one may, wh why do we need new treatments? Well, we want better efficacy. None of these treatments are a cure. None of them are, um, give us 100% remission. So we are constantly looking at patients who need switching of therapy 
We want safer treatments. We want better tolerability. We don't want people having to lose their hair or developing skin scars or, or lipoatrophy. We want um, treatment that will help with remyelination. We, we want treatment that will help with regeneration. And also, though I haven't mentioned there, we want treatments that are cost effective. We don't want, a treat, you know, the society has to pay for that, and we don't want to have pay so much that we go bankrupt. Uh, and and to what extent, uh, you know, what do we get back from that? So, currently, there are a number of uh, things that are being studied, uh, looking at particularly uh, restoring brain volume. Um, so, uh, the laquinamod is an um, oral drug. Uh, it wasn't very um, successful in terms of uh, reducing the annualized relapses, but uh, it seems to restore the brain volume. So it may be something that can be used as a restorative therapy, along with your immunosuppressive therapy. Rituximab is similar to the ocrelizumab, and again, um, in a Swedish study, showed a very highly effective um, uh, treatment when compared to the interferon. Um, ofatumab is another a similar drug to the rituximab targets a similar um, pathway, but uh, it's subcutaneous injection, so it, ha it reduces your treatment burden. You don't have to have infusion. You don't have to come to the hospital. There are a number of drugs that are coming in terms of fingolimod or gelenia-type drugs, and they're trying to reduce the side effects in terms of developing the, the macular edema or the, the swelling at the back of the eye that you um, need to have um, screening for after you start on fingolimod or cause the side effects to your heart. Um, Siponimod is also recently a, a trial uh, was published for um, uh, improvement in patients with secondary progressive MS. Then there are other uh, uh, similar common medic uh, antibiotics, tetracycline, minocycline, they, they have been uh, in a small trial shown to, to improve uh, uh, outcomes in patients with early MS, and these may be uh, drugs that may be suitable in uh, sort of third world countries. Um, so these, the, the bottom ones are um, treatments that may restore your, um, uh, uh, your, your axonal function by, st by stopping the sodium channel that the um, previous speakers were talking about. Um, and there are some other um, drugs that are used for uh, certain blood cell cancers. And again, uh, they seem to be helpful in um, uh, uh, immunosuppression in MS patients. So these are trials ongoing. And we, we may be hearing about it in the near future. And maybe they will form part of our treatment. Um, and stem cells, as I said there, it's still uh, in, as a regenerative therapy, so putting sort of neurotropic um, stem cells either through lumbar puncture or in the brain directly. There are people looking at stroke, um, motor neuron disease, Parkinson's disease, and something similar may be applicable to MS in future. So thank you.